the American plunge to uh, a police state and we're on step six. Engage in arbitrary detention and release. This scares people. It's kind of cat and mouse game. Nicholas D. Kristoff and Cheryl Dewin, uh, Wu Dun, excuse me, the investigative reporters who wrote China Wakes, The Struggle for the Soul of a Rising Power, describe pro-democracy activists in China, such as Wee Jinsheng, uh, being arrested uh, and released many times. In a closing or closed society, there is a list of dissidents and opposition leaders. You are targeted in this way once you are on the list, and it is hard to get off that list. In 2004, America's Transportation Security Admission Administration confirmed that it had a list of passengers who were targeted for security searches or worse if they tried to fly. People who have found themselves on the list? Two middle-aged women peace activists in San Francisco. The late uh, liberal Senator F Edward Kennedy, a member of Venezuela's government after Venezuela's president had criticized Bush, and thousands of ordinary U.S. citizens on both the political left and right. Walter F. Murphy is Professor Emeritus of Princeton University. He is one of the foremost constitutional scholars in the nation and author of the classic Constitutional Democracy. Murphy is also a decorated former Marine, and he is not even especially politically liberal. But on March 1st this year, he was denied a boarding pass at Newark because I was on the terrorist watch list. Have you been in any peace marches? We ban a lot of people from flying because of that, asked the airline employee. I explained, said Murphy, that I had not done, so, had not so March, but had in September 2006 given, six, given a lecture at Princeton, televised, and put on, put on the web, highly critical of George Bush for his many violations of the Constitution. That'll do it, the man said. Editor's note. Glenn Beck, yeah, okay, who has been very critical of the Obama administration, is now being forced off his daily Fox News television program. Labeling and profiling of alleged opponents of the government, i.e. pro-life demonstrators, Tea Party activists, and other conservative activists, as potential terrorists or people of interest to be closely watched, is now occurring. These individuals could soon start showing up on government watch or no-fly lists. Any war marcher, potential terrorist. Support the Constitution, potential terrorist. Pro-life demonstrator, potential terrorist. Tea Party activist, potential terrorist. History shows that the categories of enemies of the people tend to expand ever deeper into civil life. James Yee, a U.S. citizen, was the Muslim chaplain at Gitmo who was accused of mishandling classified documents. He was harassed by the U.S. military before the charges against him were dropped. He has been detained and released several times. He's, he is still of interest. Brandon Mayfield, a U.S. citizen and lawyer in Oregon, was mistakenly identified as a possible terrorist. His house was secretly broken into and his computer seized. Though he is innocent of the accusation against him, he is still on the list. It is a standard practice of, fasc practice of fascist societies that once you are on the list, you can't get off. Part 7. Way. Target key individuals. Threaten civil servants, artists, and academics with job loss if they don't toe the line. Mussolini went after the rectors of uh, state universities who did not conform to the fascist line. So did Joseph Goebbels, who purged academics who are not pro-Nazi. So does the Chinese Communist Polit Polit yeah, Politburo in punishing pro-democracy students and professors. Academia is a tinderbox of activism. So those seeking a fascist shift pun punish academics and students with professional loss if they do not coordinate in Goebbels' terms. Uh, ideal ideology, ideology, ideologically. Since civil servants are the sector of society most vulnerable to being fired by a given regime, they are also a group that fascists typically coordinate early on.
The Reich law for the reestablishment of a professional civil service was passed on April 7, 1933. Clinton, Bush, and now Obama supporters in state legislatures in several states put pressure on regents at state universities to penalize or fire academics who have been critical of their administrations or policies. As for civil servants, the Bush administration derailed the career of one military lawyer who broke up, who spoke up for fair trials for detainees while an administration official publicly intimidated the law firms that represented detainees pro, pro bono by threatening to call for their major corporate clients to boycott them. Elsewhere, a CIA contract worker who said in a closed blog that waterboarding is torture was stripped of the security clearance she needed in order to do her job. The Bush administration purged eight U.S. attorneys for what looked like insufficient political loyalty, and the Obama administration is following suit. When Goebel purged the civil service in, 19, in April 1933, attorneys were coordinated too, a step that eased the way in the increasingly brutal laws to follow. Eight control the press. Italy in the 1920s, Germany in the 30s, East Germany in the 50s, Czechoslovakia in the 60s, the Latin American dictatorships in the 70s, China in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. All dip dictatorships and would-be dictators target newspapers and journalists. They are also targeting in internet dissidents, activists, and their blogs. They threaten and harass them in more open societies that they are seeking to close, and they arrest them and worse in societies that have been closed already. The, the Committee to Protect Journalists says arrests of U.S. journalists are at an all-time high. Josh Wolf, no relation, a blogger in San Francisco, was put in jail f uh, for a year for refusing to turn over a video of an anti-war demonstration. Homeland Security brought a criminal complaint against reporter Greg uh, Palast, uh, claiming he threatened critical infrastructure when he and a TV producer were filming victims of Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana. Palast had pre previously written a bestseller critical of the Bush administration. Other reporters and writers have been punished in other ways. A few years ago, Joseph C. Wilson accused Bush in a New York Times op-ed of leading the country to war on the basis of a false charge that Saddam Hussein had acquired yellow cake uranium in Niger. His wife, Valerie Plame, was outed as a CIA spy, a form of retaliation that ended her career. Mm -hmm. Prosecution and job loss are nothing, though compared with how the U.S. is treating journalists seeking to cover the growing conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere throughout the Middle East in an unbiased way. The Committee to Protect Journalists has documented multiple accounts of the U.S. military in Iraq and Afghanistan firing upon or threatening to fire upon embedded, meaning independent, reporters and camera operators from organizing organizations ranging from Al Jazeera to the BBC. While Westerners may question the accounts by Al Jazeera, they should pay attention to the accounts of reporters such as the BBC's Kate 80. Uh, in some cases, reporters have been wounded or killed, including ITN's Terry Lloyd in 2003. Both CBS and the Associated Press have had staff members seized by the U.S. military and taken to violent prisons. The news organizations were unable to see the evidence against their staffers. Over time, in closing societies, real news is supplanted by fake news and false documents. In the Bush won Gulf War, the American people were told that Saddam Hussein was having babies in Kuwait hospitals thrown out of windows and massacred in Kuwait. It was not true. They were also told by Bush II about WMDs and much more that was later proven to be false in order to manipulate public support for those wars. The yellow cake charge, too, was based on forged papers. You won't have a shutdown of news in modern America. It is not possible. But you can have, as Frank Rich and uh, Sidney Blumenthal have pointed out, 
a steady stream of lies polluting the news well. What you already have is a White House directing a stream of false information that is so relentless that it is increasingly hard to sort out truth from untruth. In a fascist system, it's not the lies that count, but the muddying. When citizens can't tell real news from fake, they give up their demands for accountability bit by bit. Part 9. Dissident equals treason. Cast dissident as treason and criticism as espionage. Every closing society does this, just as it elaborates laws that increasingly criminalize certain kinds of speech and expand the dish definition of spy and traitor. When Bill Keller, the publisher of the New York Times, ran the Licht Bile Risen stories, Bush called the Times leaking of classifica classified information disgraceful, while Republicans in Congress called for Keller to be charged with treason, and certain commentators and news outlets kept up the kept up the treason drumbeat. Some commentators, as Connison uh, noted, r reminded readers smugly that one penalty for violating the Espionage Act is execution. Uh, we've seen that just recently, too. Um, okay. It is important to recall that the 1938 Moscow show trial accused the editor of Izvestia, uh, Nikolai Bukharin, of treason. Bukharin was in fact executed. And it is important to remind Americans that when the 1970 S17 Espionage Act was last widely invoked during the infamous 1919 Palmer raids, dissidents and activists were arrested without warrants and sweeping roundups, kept in jail for up to five months had beaten, starved, suffocated, tortured, and threatened with death, according to the historian Myra McPherson. After that, dissent was muted in America for a decade. In Stalin's Soviet Union, dissidents were enemies of the people. National so Socialists called those who supported Weimar democracy November traitors. And here is where the circle closes. Most Americans do not realize that since September 2006, when Congress wrongly, foolishly passed the Military Commissions Act, the President has the power to call any U.S. citizen an enemy combatant. He has the power to define what enemy combatant means. The President can also delegate to anyone he chooses in the executive branch the right to define enemy com combatants any way he or she wants and then seize those Americans accordingly. Even if you or, or I are American citizens, even if we turn out to be completely innocent of what Big Brother has accused us of doing, he has the power to have us seized as we are changing planes at Newark tomorrow, or have us taken with a knock on the door, ship you or me to a Navy brig, and keep you or me in isolation, possibly for months, while awaiting trial. Prolonged isolation as psychiatrists know, triggers psychosis in otherwise mentally healthy prisoners. That is why Stalin's gulag had an isolation cell, like Gitmo's, in every satellite prison. Camp 6, the newest, most brutal facility at Gitmo, is all isolation cells. We U.S. citizens will get a trial eventually, for now. But legal rights activists at the Center for Constitutional Rights say that recent administrations are trying increasingly aggressively to find ways to get around giving even U.S. citizens fair trials. Enemy combatant is a status offense. It is not even something you have uh, you have to have done. Uh, we have absolutely moved over into a preventative detention model. You look like you could do something bad. You might do something bad. So we're going to hold you, said a spokeswoman of the CCR. We saw this happening over in Britain uh, with the Love Police. Pre-detained them. Most Americans surely do not get this yet. No wonder. It is hard to believe, even though it is true. In every closing society, at a certain point, there are some high-profile arrests usually of opposition leaders, clergy, and journalists. 
then everything goes quiet. After those arrests, there are still newspapers, courts, TV, and radio, and the facades of a civil society. There just isn't real dissent. There, isn't, there just isn't freedom. If you look at history, just before those arrests is where we are right now. And the tenth part. Suspend the rule of law. The John Warner Defense Authorization Act of 2007 gave the President new powers over the National Guard. This means that in a national emergency, which the President now has enhanced powers to declare, he can send Michigan's militia to enforce a state of emergency that, is, that he has declared in Oregon over the objections of the state's governor and its citizens. Even as Americans have focused on the Britney Spears, Liz, Lindsay Lohan, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Charlie Sheen meltdowns, the New York Times editorialized about this shift. A disturbing recent phenomenon in Washington is that laws that strike to the heart of American democracy have been passed in the dead of night, beyond actual insurrection. The President may now use military troops as a domestic police force in response to a natural disaster a disease outbreak, terrorist attack, or any other condition. Critics see this as a clear violation of the Posse Comitatus Act, which was meant to restrain the federal government from using the military for domestic law enforcement. Democratic Senator Patrick Leahy said that the bill encourages a president to declare federal martial law. It also violates the very reason the founders set up our system of government as they did, Having seen citizens bullied by monarch soldiers, the founders were terrified of exactly this kind of concentration of military power over American people in the hands of an oppressive executive or faction. Of course, the United States might not be vulnerable to the violent total closing down of the system that followed Mussolini's march on Rome or Hitler's roundup of political prisoners. Our democratic habits are too resilient and our military and judiciary uh, too independent for any kind of scenario like that. Rather, as other critics are noting, our experience in democracy could be closed down by a process of erosion, such as clearly been the case over the past few decades. Editors note. However, if the present or some future administration should choose to trigger a huge crisis, terrorist or otherwise, and blame it on political activists or dis dissidents, such as the Tea Party movement, such as Hitler did in the Reichstag disaster in 1933, the police state could literally emerge overnight. In conclusion, it is a mistake to think that early in a fascist shift you see the profile of barbed wire against the sky. In the early days, things looked normal on the surface. Peasants were celebrating harvest festivals in Calabria in 1922. People were shopping and going to the movies in Berlin in 1931. Early on, as W. H. Auden put it, the horror is always elsewhere. While someone is being tortured, children are skating, ships are sailing, dogs go on with their doggy life, and everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. As Americans turn away quite leisurely, keeping tuned to internet shopping, Facebook or Twitter, and American Idol, the foundations of democracy are being fatally corroded. Something has changed profoundly that weakens us unpre unprecedentedly. Our democratic traditions, independent judiciary, and free press do their work today in a context in which we are at war in the long war, a war without end on a battlefield described as the globe, in a context that gives the President, without U.S. citizens realizing it yet, the power over U.S. citizens of freedom or long solitary incarceration on his say-so alone. Uh, editors know, one key example of this new presidential power over the people was when the Democratic Congress last year authorized President Obama to censor or completely shut down the Internet for up to four months and renew the shutdown at his whim. That means a hollowness has been expanding under the foundation of all these still free looking institutions and this foundation can give way literally 
overnight under certain kinds of pressure. To prevent an outcome, we have to think about the what ifs. What if, in a year and a half, there is another attack, say, God forbid, a dirty bomb. The executive can declare a state of emergency. History shows that any leader of any party will be tempted to maintain emergency powers after the crisis has passed. With the gutting of traditional checks and balances, we are no less endangered by a President Obama than a President Bush, because any executive will be tempted to enforce his or her will through edict rather than the arduous, uncertain process of democratic negotiation and compromise. What if the publisher or editor of a major U.S. newspaper, newsletter, or internet blog were charged with treason, espionage, or terrorism? What if he or she got 10 years in jail? What would the news publications look like the next day? Judging from history, they would not cease publishing, but they would suddenly be very polite. Right now, only a handful of patriots are trying to hold back the tide of tyranny for the rest of us. Staff at the center of the constitutional rights, rights who faced death threats for representing the detainees, yet persisted all the way to the Supreme Court, Tea Party and other Christian rights activists, and prominent conservatives trying to roll back the corrosive new laws are standing in the gap for the rest of the American people. This small, desperate collection of people needs everybody's help, including that of the great masses of Americans, of Europeans, of others internationally who are willing to put pressure on the U.S. government because they can see what the U.S. Unre uh, can see what a U.S. unrestrained by real constitutional freedom at home can mean for the rest of the world. We need to look at history and face the what ifs, for if we keep going down this road. The end of America could come for each of us in a different way, at a different moment. Each of us might have a different moment when we feel forced to look back sadly and think, that is how it was before. This is the way it is now. The accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands is the definition of terror, tyranny, wrote James Madison. We still have the choice to stop going down this road. We can stand our ground and fight for our nation and take up the banner the Founders asked us to carry. People, think about what's been said here. You see it around you every day. We need to put a stop to this. We need to put our foot down and say, no more. Peace out, folks.